We are God's creations, each of us crafted for a purpose. We begin our journey as dreamers in a world filled with possibility. Nothing seems impossible. Although we have faced a global pandemic like no other, God's purpose for our life has not changed. Let's together restore what was diminished and fully live out our purpose. It's time to dream again. Good afternoon. It's great to be with you. Let me try again. Good afternoon. <laughs> After that roaring worship, hello. No, right? God is here. God's presence is here. And I welcome those of you that are online. I'm glad you decided to tune in today. You know, um, I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I had uh, just a, a heck of a week, right? I uh, got a lot I'm juggling. Anyway, by come Thursday, I had already done 45 hours that week, right? And so I knew it was way too much. So I called the audible in my life. I said, okay, I got to go home. It was around 8-ish. And so I get in my car to go home, and I called Andy, and I asked him what he and the, my boys that are there, I'm like, what did you guys have for dinner, right? Hoping for leftovers or something. And he goes, oh, we had cauliflower pizza. Ugh. Right? I'm like, oh, no leftovers there, right? And so I thought, okay, no problem, right? So I thought, okay, I'm so tired. I'll just go through and swing by, you know, uh, one of the, the shops near our home. And, of course, that's Chick-fil-A, right? And even at 8 o'clock, I waited in line, right? What's that about? I don't know. It just is. So I got my food, and, oh, it smells so divine because I hadn't eaten. Uh, I left that morning early around 7, 7.30 and had cereal. So I was starving. Boy, did those waffle fries smell good, right? And I was like, no, Sharon, control. No, right? And so I got home, went in the house. Of course, it's dark. And I was met by my golden doodle, who's a big dog, right? And she just, oh, she just loves to be petted when you first come in. And so I gave her attention. You know, my eye was on my bag, right? And I gave her the attention. I walk up. I put it on the counter. I'm like, okay. And I go wash my hands. And I'm thinking, you just can't just eat out of the bag, although that's what I wanted to do, right? So I said, well, let me go get a plate. You know, I put my little chicken sandwich and the little fries, you know, took my tea, put it in a proper glass, and it looked so pretty. And it was all on the counter. And I said, well, you know, I had my high heels from working out. I'm not going to go change, right? So I put my slippers on, get my sweater. <laughs> yeah. I come out. It just took me two seconds. I come back out. I look on the counter. And my chicken sandwich that was closed laying there, is now open with the meat extracted, <laughs> right? And then the pickles have been spit out back onto the counter. And some of my waffle fries, well, most of them were gone. I was like, what happened? I've been dreaming and wanting that, right? And I looked over, and the dog's like licking its face, right? I'm like, Bella, that's her name. I'm like, can you, what did you do? I think she saw the fire in my eyes because she took off under the table to hide, and she needed to hide, right? And so I was left with having cauliflower pizza. And I got to thinking, you know, that's like us. We have this dream, this expectation, and we want something so bad, we go to all the effort, you know, and we're trying to make sure it's going to happen, only to have it meet in failure or disaster, right? And so we're in a series about it's time to dream again, and Pastor Andy's been talking to us about the dream within, that the importance of the dream is to help that we understand how we're designed, right? How, what our purpose is. It matches up with the dreams that God gives us. And so uh, that dream, he asked us to sit and talk to the Lord about. And uh, many of you guys were texting back and forth or you, text, you know, sent an email saying that you were in that process, and I'm really happy to hear that. Now, uh, I was thinking about this, and I thought, well, I want to teach on today and talk to you about the struggle behind the dream, right? It just, the dream just never just happens. And so there's always a struggle. And I want to talk to you about that because I think that's something that we all have in common. Now, it is my practice to ask the Holy Spirit to come. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. And even those where you're sitting at watching this, just kind of bow your head. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come even more. Holy Spirit, I know you're in this facility. I felt you. And so I ask that you take every nook and cranny and that you would fill it up even more and that those, Father, that came in, that you would compress into them, Lord, that they would actually feel your presence upon them and that you would hit them at different times and excavate their heart while we're talking, Lord. Allow them to know that you know every hair on their head 
every part of their life, and you are coming divinely to touch them today. I expect that, Lord. I know you're going to do that. And it's not just in the auditorium. God's going to do that for you at home, where you're at, wherever you're at watching this video. God is going to come alive. He's going to meet you right where you're at. So, Father, I thank you, and we give you this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. So, uh, I do think that whenever we go after a dream, we're always met with a difficulty, <laughs> you know? It's hard to make the dream come about, yet it is God who gives us this dream, so why does he make it so stinking hard, right? Why is there so much struggle? Well, I've been contemplating this, and here's what I think. I think we struggle, right, in getting the dream and achieving it because God is more interested in who we are becoming on the journey than, who, than the commodity that we produce at the end, right? He's not so much interested in the dream as he is into our character and what are we becoming. Who are we becoming in that process, right? And so uh, he seems to want to, to grow us on our journey, and so we need to understand that it's all a process to him, and he's looking at us, not what we produce at the end. And why? Why does he do that? Because I know, just like you know, that we will stand before the Lord, each and every one of us, and give an account of how we spent our lives. And all we're bringing is ourself, our character, and the things that we have done with people, how we've loved, how we carried ourselves, how we shared the gospel, right? And so he is cultivating us to be there. Now, the struggle is real. The struggle for our dreams and our aspirations is real. And so I'm going to take a character today, and his, his name is Jacob, right? And Jacob is a character in the Old Testament, and we're going to look at his life, and we're going to uh, see what, how he handled uh, the difficulty, the struggle of the dream God gave him and how that came about. Okay? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to uh, just set the backdrop for you so that you can actually follow along so you can understand some of the struggle that he's having. So first, I want you to remember who Jacob is. Jacob is the uh, son of Isaac, right, and Rebekah. And Jacob is a twin to his brother Esau, right? And they are the grandsons of Abraham, of, uh, who was the father of the Jewish faith, right? And so we see that his lineage with that is very deep and rich indeed. But what we need to know is that Jacob, um, <laughs> Jacob all of his life, even though he's a twin, Esau came out first and then Jacob. And so Esau got the birthright. That means he, he got everything. And Jacob did not, right? So he's behind him. And yet the mother at the time that she found out she's pregnant, she had two babies inside of her. God said that the uh, younger would serve, uh, that would lead the older, right? So she knew that. And she pondered that in her heart. And so when the boys were born, she knew something was going to take place because he also, God also told her there's two nations that were warring inside of her. And so we see this uh, come about, and so we see that Rebecca is favoring uh, Jacob, and the father favors, uh, yeah, his older brother, right, Esau. And so you see the, the family dynamics going on, and it's so chaotic, it's dysfunctional. Sometimes when I read the Bible, I'm going, oh, they have it too back then, <laughs> right? They did. It was a very dysfunctional family, the way they were interchanging. And so we see this, right, where Jacob actually, with the help of his mother, he deceives his brother Esau and his father and steals the birthright, right, setting up pandemonium in their home. And so Rebecca uh, tells Jacob he better flee because Esau's coming after him to take his life right? That's what's happening here. So, uh, you know, the mother sends Jacob to go to the cousin's house or the uncle's house, Laban, you know, in a nearby area. And so she's, she's sending him away. And now he's running for his life. He's going to his uncle's house. He doesn't know what's going on. And right in the middle, this is where I love this, right in the middle of all the junk, right? God comes and visits him. And I want to show you this scripture and it's quite, it's actually a couple of scriptures, and it's rather long, but hang with me because you need to understand God's visitation with him, okay? So what we see here in Genesis 28, 12 through 22, it's on your outline too, it says, here's the dream. Jacob had a dream. He saw a steroid uh, resting on the earth which it uh, with the top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Then above it stood the Lord and the Lord said, 
I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, right, grandpa, and the God of Isaac, your father. Now, here comes the promise that he makes to Jacob. Ready? I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. And what he means is everywhere he puts his head is going to be given to him, right? And it says, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. He's talking about the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. He says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. He's talking about how we get blessed because of Christ came through that lineage. And it says, I am with you and will watch over you. Yay, he's going to take care of him. You, uh, you, wherever you go, and what I will bring you back to this land. That's foretelling of the exile of the Jews and then bringing them back, and they get their nation, right, in 1948. And so that's a, a prediction there. And I will leave you until, and I will not leave you until I have done all that I have promised you. So God's presence, right? Now, here you go, Jacob is going to wake up out of his dream, and he's going to go. When Jacob woke up of his sleep, he said, surely God is in this place. Now, I love that because God's in this place. He's everywhere. We just need to recognize it, right? He said, and I was not aware of it. Then early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, because that's what he slept on, and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He's anointing it. This is a special place because he met God there. And he's going to call that place Bethel. And then Jacob made a vow. This is what he's saying to all that God had shared with him in the promise. He says, if God will be with me, right, if, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey, because remember, he's going to Laban. He doesn't know where he's going. He's running from the past. Then the Lord will be my God. And of all that you give me, Lord, right, I will give you a tenth. Now, I like that because he says, uh, you were the God of my father and my grandfather, but if you do this, then you're my God. Do you see that? He said, and to signify that, my behavior, I'm going to give you a tenth of everything that, that is mine because Jacob knew it was an act of worship. It's an act of gratitude. It's an act of his faith. And so he, he, uh, he does that. So here you go. We've got this story, and we've got this uh, great promise that right in the middle of all the chaos that God gives to Jacob, right? And I love this because God gives us dreams when we're far from him. We have those. And if you really, once you start to dial in, and I'll show you how to, you actually can go back and realize that God has been with you all this time. Okay, and so God gives us dreams, but here you go. One important thing I want you to notice with Jacob running, Jacob had a lot of issues, he was not ready for the dream, right? And so here you go. Now comes the struggle because God's going to take him to, in a pathway, and I've kind of had fun with it. And I've made four places, four phases that he goes through to achieve the dream. I believe these are the same four phases that you and I wrestle with our dream and, and following after God, right? So we're going to look at those. So the first one, the first struggle, but the four of them is the crisis phase. Yeah, you're going to go through a crisis. Yay! Okay. So with the crisis, what's happening is in the crisis, we're beginning to the, understand that the struggle is with others and God. So we begin to understand how to separate that out. Remember, Jacob is fleeing, right? He does go to his uncle's house, Laban, and he's there, <laughs> and, he, and he's into deception, and he gets deceived, and he's there serving for 14 years trying to get the woman he loved, right? And so he's, he's working for her, and then he gets tricked. He gets the sister, Leah. In the end, he has two wives, right? And God blesses him in, in serving there his time with his uncle. And he has all this cattle. And then he has servants. He has all these children. And the day comes when he's released from the vow that he gave to his uncle. And he wants to go home. He just wants to go home, right? And so he knows that there's a problem back there. But he's going, to, he's going to take his family now, and he's going to march him towards going home. And this is where we're going to fast forward in the Bible, because we are in Genesis 28. We're going to go to Genesis 32 now. And what I want you to see in the journey, he gets to this place, and it's a river. Now, he's got his whole family. It's a river. And the minute he steps over that, something's going to happen. But let's look at what happens here. After he, Jacob, sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Now, I want you to get this picture. Jacob's got his wife, his kids, his servants, his animals, everything, and he sends them on over the river. But he himself stays back. 
Now, I don't know what that says about being married, right? <laughs> I think that's kind of interesting. However, he's there. Jacob's there with his thoughts. So Jacob was left all alone. And so he's thinking about his brothers, thinking about what he did. He's trying to figure out a plan, you know, to get to be able to make everything right. And so he's really in this place of focusing on his brother and the, the home and all that. Well, here it goes. It says, and a man came and wrestled with him till daybreak. What the heck is that, right? A man came and wrestled with him before uh, daybreak? I mean, what? Where did this man come from? Who is this man, right? And so what's happening, what we're seeing here is that Jacob is wrestling with an unknown man, right? And this unknown man is going to be shown to him to be a supernatural wrestling event that's going on, right? And Jacob is going to learn that he has a bigger issue than his brother that he's fearing going to see. He's got an issue with God, God has to, to lead him to this place so that he can wrestle with him himself, right? And he does this before the dream can become manifest in Jacob's life. Now, Sharon, how do you know that this is God? Well, because another part in Hosea, it says here, before uh, Jacob was born, the struggles with his brother, which we've talked about, and then, and when he became a man, he even fought with who? God, exactly. So we know that this unknown man is God right? And so we need to know that, that in our lives, this has implementation for us as well, right? We need to know that, that we are like Jacob in so many ways. We wrestle with God all the time. Well, what does that look like? Well, I wrestle with him who's going to be in control, him or I, right? I wrestle with, will I trust him, you know, with my future? And I'll look and say, the dream, I have to make it happen. I got to work really hard, pull myself up by my bootstraps, right? It's all about me, myself, and I doing this thing, right? And so we wrestle with God, and God allows us to wrestle with him. Now, to really drive this home, I want you, right where you're at, I want you to think of the biggest um, problem or the biggest conflict that you have in your life. I want you to pop that into your brain, pop a name, pop an issue. Got it? Okay, there's a commonality with each and every one of you, right? There's a root cause of that conflict, and they're all different, right? And here's the root cause. The root cause comes out of your question, will I obey God and will I do what is right? Will I obey God and will I do what is right in this situation that you're in? And the second is, will I trust God? Will I trust God to, to work it all out? See, that's really what we're wrestling. So you might be wrestling with a spouse, with a job, with whatever it was in your mind. But really what you're wrestling with is your choice, your choice to obey your God and to do what is right. And we find that in his word. And then it's, will you trust him that no matter what it looks like, that somehow he's going to work it out, right? And so we wrestle with God. Each and every one of us wrestles, and right? Now, God allows the crisis to come into your life and my life because he's after wanting us to be able to change. And I don't know about you, but until the pain becomes high enough to address the fear of change, we tend not to change. And so God allows us to get into a, a crisis so that we can change, right? And then when we get into a crisis, he wants to lead us to this next phase, which is the commitment phase. That's what it is. But really what we're doing is God is testing my faith and his promises to bless me, right? He's testing us. He's saying, okay, Let's see, you've got this crisis and how you're handling it and you're wrestling. We're going to go back to that scripture, but I'm going to add to it this time. It says, a man came and wrestled with him till daybreak. We just read that. And then it says, and when the man saw that he couldn't win the match, this is interesting, he struck Jacob's hip and knocked it out of, out of, joint, out of the joint socket, which is painful. And then the man said, let me go, for it is almost dawn. And then Jacob panted. We don't pant. Panting is what a dog does, right? So this word is interesting. The word panting is going to be because I want you to see the um, total um, uh, exuberance and all in that Jacob has got going on here. I will not let you go until you bless me, right? 
And now I'm going to have to interpret some of that so that you get this idea. But basically what you're seeing here is you're seeing that this man that's wrestling with, uh, with Jacob, I told you it's God, right? So could God not win the match? Well, of course, that's foolishness, isn't it? God could. But God chose not to go in and squish him like a little bug. God chose to wrestle with him. And I believe it shows you and I that God is long-suffering with us. He wrestles with us because it took, it's going to take us a while to figure this thing out, right? And he gives us the space and the time, and he lets us wrestle. Who's in control? How is it going to look? You know, uh, do I have to follow your rules? They seem so limiting, right? And so what we see here is God will wrestle with each and every one of us until we come to a place where uh, that we, we give him total, we surrender and he has total control, right? Because the idea of wrestling is to pin your opponent, to pin them down so they go, I surrender, I tap out, right? And so that's what God does. He wrestles with us until we get to that point. Now, somewhere in here, the supernatural begins to overtake Jacob, and he knows that he knows that he's wrestling with God. He knows this is not like just a regular human uh, interaction, and so it begins to dawn on him, and he's like, he's like, wow, if this is God, then he can really help me, and I'm really in need of help, and that's why he makes this statement, I'm not going to let you go, right? And it's here that the commitment that Jacob has to making God the God, his God, begins to be formalized. He knows that he can't get any help anywhere else other than, you know, with God. And so he's wrestling. He's not going to let him go, right? You can feel the intensity of, of Jacob here. And so we need to know that's what God's after, right? I can tell you different things that have come up in my life where I've been faced with uh, just humongous challenges. And I'm thinking, I can't overcome them. But you know, God uses those. One of them is my learning disability. You see, I'm old enough to tell you that there was a time when school, school didn't have anything that they offered, any kind of help for kids who couldn't learn well. And I was learning disabled, which meant I had a hard time learning in the conventional way right? And so my whole existence in education told me I was stupid. I was slow. Yet I knew that was not true. And I tell you what, I had to learn perseverance and I had long suffering. And, you know, and then I got, all, I got a lot of scars in that environment. And when I found the Lord, I brought it to him. It was one of the first things I brought to him. And I asked him to heal me. Why? Because nobody wants that. Nobody wants to have that in their life. This is hard, right? And so for me, it's like Jacob's hip, be, hip being knocked out of its socket, right? Jacob is from this point on going to walk with the limp. God allows us in the crisis and the things in our life to form us in a way that we walk with a limp. Because of my learning disability, I walk with a limp. There's no way I would ever get up here and do what I'm doing. None. I would not, except for God asked me to. And I get up here and I walk with a limp because I know that in my, uh, in my inabilities, in my in, you know, sufficiency or not lack of it, right, that God will come through and he'll make up all the difference. And I know I'm weak. And when I pray for healing on this, he told me, no, my strength will be manifested best in your weakness. So my friends, I walk with a limp and I do it willingly. Why? Because my God shows up better and more, right? And so we need to know, just like Jacob, that God works in your life. And things that come in and you look and you go, how could that ever be used by God? He can use it. Now, at least you'd be tempted to think, well, Sharon, that's you. You're a pastor, right? Well, I'm going to invite one of my young friends, Bernicia Jones, to come up and to tell you her life story. She's one of the, my colleagues, one of my ministers in the youth department, right? Next Gen. Can you give her a warm welcome? Come on out. <laughs> Good morning. As Pastor Sharon said, my name is Bernicia. I work here at Vineyard as the youth coordinator. I'm 27 years old, um, and I'm also currently pursuing an MA in Christian discipleship over at Regent University. Um, and so when I was younger, um, I was born and raised here in Hampton Roads. Um, I also grew up in the church. And I remember being young and praying specifically for my family. That was my dream, that my family would be unified. But that was not my reality. 
reality. Um, my dad would yell a lot and my mom would cry a lot. And I internalized a lot of those emotions of anger and sadness that followed me and, and still try to follow me throughout my life. Um, by high school, my parents were getting separated and it was a little bit of a relief just because I knew the arguing would stop. Um, but the damage was already done. Um, and so instead of turning to Jesus like I was taught, I turned to the world. Um, and so I started going in and out of toxic relationships. And, you know, they, they felt good for a while. It felt like love. Um, but as we all know, that was not the case. <laughs> and so I was running um, and I was facing anxiety and depression. And I was trying to cover it up with antidepressants. And I was taking Adderall to just try to keep me going. Um, and then at about 22, I just, I crashed, I, I hit my rock bottom, um, I lost my job, I lost my apartment, I felt like all of my freedom, and I had to move home with my mom, and it was there in that room I spent high school in that I had to face all of that hurt, all of that pain, and for weeks I would dream and just uh, relive those things I went through as a young girl, and it was very painful, um, but then I just felt that pulling of the Lord sh telling me that it wasn't me, it was him showing me all of the times where I decided not to trust in him, and so I decided to change my dream. And I decided to dream to live a life in the fullness of Christ. And so that summer that I moved home, I bought a devotional Bible. Um, I stopped taking those antidepressants and, and Adderall medications that I was using. And I changed my perspective on everything that I was going through. Amen. And so now... I am going through this journey, you know, and there are good days and there are bad days, but I'm learning to trust God and his purpose for my life. I have a wonderful husband, Bernard Jones Jr. <laughs> and God has um, really allowed us to overcome a lot together and, and to see that, hey, you don't look at what you've been through in your family or, or uh, your parents of, of their marriage, but you trust God for his purpose for your life. Um, and so... I can't go back and hug that young me anymore, but I can look forward to the youth that are in front of me. And so my purpose of being up here today to share my story is to say that, hey, the dream is wrapped up in the journey with Christ, and that's something that this world cannot live up to. Amen? Thank you for allowing me to share. Very good. Well, you know that your kids, your youth are well taken care of. Right? She's, she's a mighty woman of faith. Okay? Very blessed to have her. All right. So we have been talking about this uh, commitment level, right, that God wants to build like a foundation in your life where he can build on it. And it's the commitment to the Lord. It's, it's commitment to him. And that's what Jake was wrestling with. He figured that out. That's what you need to figure out within the difficulties. Let's see if we get the TV back on. Oh, there you go. Whoa. Okay, so the next phase we're going to look at right here is the confession phase, all right? The confession phase. That's where uh, we've made the commitment to the Lord, you know, to, to God's plans. But now we're going to come into the confession stage, and it's here. I love it. I have to admit that I'm my biggest problem. <laughs> I love that, right? It's not your brother or your sister. It's not your husband or your wife, right? It's not your boss or your kids. The biggest problem you have is yourself, that's right. The biggest problem you have is yourself, right? And, and you're your own worst enemy, right? You fight with your insecurities and your worries and your fears and your resentments, right? So you're your own worst enemy here, and you fight your shame and your anxiety. And so we need to have an awakening here, you know, within this, uh, this phase here where we begin to confess that we are our own worst enemy. And here you go. You see that with Jacob. Now, Jacob's wrestling with God, right? And then the man who's God asks him, what is your name? My name is Jacob. Now, you read that and go, yeah, right? But he, the man who's God is asking this question, who are you? Like, for me, and I read that, I'm like, God doesn't know who he is. He made him, right? He's been watching after him. He gave him the dream. So sometimes when God asks a question, it's not for his own uh, knowledge. It's to help the person to be able to recognize something in themselves. Listen, when you feel like God's asking you a question, it's not because he doesn't know, because he knows everything, but he wants you to recognize something in your life. And so Jacob's response is to honestly say, my name is Jacob. And for most of us, we read and go, and? 
right? But what you don't know is that in the ancient times, this name Jacob, uh, it was like other names, it carried meaning. And the meaning was what what was being challenged here, right? So God wanted him to come to the recognition that Jacob means deceiver or manipulator, manipulator, right? And so what has happened is Jacob is and has been fulfilling his name, right? He's deceived all kinds of people. He's manipulated all kinds of people, right, to get his way. And so this is who he was. And so God looks at it and he says, oh, what's your name? He goes, Jacob. And so he's owning it. At a gut level, he's owning it. You know, I believe that God wants us to own who we are. If you were to take your, uh, your, like, your biggest um, fault, character fault, right, and you were to put it in here, what would it look like? You know, would somebody go, hey, gossiper, <laughs> right? Or, hey, insecure one. Hey, you know, uh, rude one. Hey, liar. Hey, Dealer, right? Whoa. You know, it takes a whole lot of nerve to sit and talk to God about who we really are in our flaws. But let me tell you a secret. He already knows, right? He just wants you to know. And why is it so important that you understand your character flaws? Because you can't move forward if you don't know where you're at, right? So we begin to understand we own our own stuff. And then that leads us to the last phase that God takes us to. It's the conversion phase. And in the conversion phase, what happened is God gives me a new identity for the dream. And so God is going to give Jacob a new identity. Watch this. He says, then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, deceiver, right? The one who tricks people. He said, instead, you will be called Israel. This is his new name. And then God blessed him. And I want you to watch this. God can't bless him until he identifies and gets a new name from God, right? This is a very important process for you to, to think through here, right? Uh, and so we need to understand that God wants to give us a new identity, that God wants to talk to us about our identity, right? Because Israel, this is how he changes it, Israel means prince uh, with God. So he sees, God sees Jacob. God looks at Jacob and he sees all the flaws, all the insecurities, all the emotional problems, right? And Jacob admits it that this is me. But here you go. God sees more than God. God sees how he created Jacob. And so he looks inside of Jacob and he says, there's an Israel in there. There's an Israel and I'm going to call it out now. Now's the time to come to the new identity. And you can feel the Holy Spirit when I say that for you. That it is your time that God is calling the Israel out. Well, what is the Israel? The Israel is the child of God that you were meant to be. You see, we cannot fulfill the dream that God has for us. We cannot fulfill or find our purpose without encountering the new name that God places upon us. And I tell you what, I started with this message and I talked about the struggles behind uh, being able to get the dream because here's what I know about people. They buy into the lie. They stay back. They really know what they're like. I told you, go do an exercise, the I am. You already know that. It's in your gut. And so you just qualify yourself. It can't be me. I can't do that. I'm too weak. I have a learning disability, right? I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not aggressive enough. And so we tell God why we can't do the dream, or we tell him who we are. Did you not really see me, Right? And so the biggest thing, listen, the biggest thing that God can do for us is challenge the way we see ourselves. You know, if he can challenge you to see as he sees, right, he can just wreck, wreck all the lies and distortion that are around you. And he doesn't just want you to know where you're at. He wants to give you a new name. He wants to do something new in your life, right? And for many of us, that have accepted Jesus Christ, and we raised our hand, and we said, yes, I need Jesus. When we did that, God moved in on our behalf, and he's still moving in. And so he says this promise to us here in 2 Corinthians. It says, if anyone is in Christ, that's when you raised your hand and said, I want Jesus. This person is a new creation, right? Not this person turns over a new leaf. No, this person's a whole dang new creation. The old is gone. See that? The old labels, the old way of behaving, it's gone and the new has come. 
And so what you need to know is that when we give our life to Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. It's as if God has called and seen you and called out the, you know, the name that he has for you. You are Israel. You are a leader of God's people. You lead beside God. He walks with you. He's inside of you. That's what that means, right? And when we give Christ that and he comes and he envelops us and he lives inside of us, we don't have to play the old cards that we were given. They look different. Now, let me say this. It's a process. But you begin when you step out and you say yes to Jesus. And then he begins to work and call the new you out. And he's got a dream. That's what I love about this, right? He's got this dream for you that he wants to birth. And it matches perfectly with how he's called you, how he's developed you, how he's made you. I mean, we're huge on this. That's why we do the growth tracks, right? Today is growth track two, and we want you to know how God has designed you. And that's what they'll be talking about. Listen, the job is yours now. What will you do with the information that was given to you? You see, the dream that God has for you is going to take you through a crisis where you're going to need to come to a commitment. And then he's going to want to talk to you about who you are. And so you've got to be able to understand the makeup that you have. And then he wants to call out of you who you are supposed to be, right? And you see this pattern happens over and over again. And that's what he wants to do today. So bow your heads with me. I'm going to close this in prayer. Holy Spirit, yeah, I thank you, Lord, for being here. Why quiet? Because we've been running now for 30 minutes. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you individually. So Holy Spirit, just come more upon your people. Come more, you drew all these men and women here. Only you can answer their heart's cry. So Holy Spirit, just come begin to uh, put a knowledge and understanding that there is an Israel inside of each and every man and woman in here. Yes, and that you're calling it out. I thank you, Father. Okay, so foundation. So, all right, so there are some of you, the Father's talking to you, and he's saying you don't have that foundation, that commitment. You've never really made it. You've been part of something, and you've been around it, but you haven't declared that you want Jesus Christ and what he has to give you, this new life. And so that's where you need to begin today. And so I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a second to, to raise your hand. You see everybody's head is bowed. And everybody's in a posture of prayer, and they're praying for you because we know, yes, we know what an important decision this is. You see, I was where you were, and this is the step you take. And so I'm going to invite you, whether you're watching online or you're here in the audience, I'm going to uh, ask you to just shoot up your hand and uh, let me know that you want to begin this firm foundation with Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm going to give you a second to think about it, and then your hand can go up. Mm hmm I see. Okay. Yes, even those of you at home, there's a button there that says, I'm raising my hand. Just hit that. Why? Why is it public? Because it's public before the Lord, but it's between you and him. Okay, so you can put your hands down. Now I want you to pray this prayer with me. It's simple, but it's such a profound prayer. You just say, Father God, go ahead and say that right where you're at. Father God, I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my savior, the forgiver of my sins. And I ask Holy Spirit that you would come and fill me up. I don't understand everything, but I'm moving towards you. So I'm going to pray for those that are praying that. Father God, I thank you that you wrote their name in the book of life and that you sealed that promise and that now you're going to teach them what it means to stand on a firm foundation. And Lord, we have the greatest commandment given to us that I shall learn to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and with all your strength. And in the dream, that is what you want. You want us to be able to grow like that, to be able to stand before you 
with an honest, sincere heart and know that we gave it all, that we gave it our all, and that we rose to the occasion of being worthy of being called the children of God. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would work amongst your people and that this week, Lord, as they sit to write up the goals or to write up the vision that they have, that there'll be a new inspiration, that they'll be able to see themselves as you see them, that they'll be able to identify the purpose and calling you have in their life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, guys, we are switching over. We're going to go back and do uh, one more song with worship. But before I do that, let me give you uh, just a few uh, instructions. If you gave your life to Christ today, you need to tell somebody about it so you can fill out the tab on your program, right? Or those online, you can uh, fill out. There's a form there that you can fill it out. Why? So that we can help you with your next steps. Uh, Your next step in here is to go to the grow track, right? Why? Because we're in there and we can meet you and talk with you and help you. Okay, so that's uh, that. And when you're leaving, if you fill out and you want a prayer request or whatever, you can always put it in the the, uh, connect box that's up on the wall. All right. Now, I spoke earlier about Jacob, that Jacob's response to getting the dream was to say, God, you're my God. And then to say, I'm going to give you a tenth of everything that you give me. And so in that statement, we recognize that we, uh, that tithing, that's giving to God, right, is an act of worship. It's also an, an act of your faith, right, of your gratitude. And so those of us that call this their church home, now is the time that you can, uh, that you can participate. You can give in these different ways here, and they're on the screen, right, for you that are watching online. You can participate also. But here's the important thing you need to know. If this is not your home, then you do not have to give. You're welcome to, but you don't have to. You see, those of us that have been so touched by the Lord, I can't wait to be able to give to him. I can't. It's my privilege, right, to do what I can to advance the kingdom of God. All right, guys, stand on up, and we're going to go back into worship. And before we go into worship, right, I'm going to speak a blessing over you, okay? So if you want a blessing, just put your hand like this, and it's coming your way. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would breathe upon the people, that you would cause them, Father, to know that they are a city set on a hill, that they are to be a light into the generations around them. They are to make a difference in this life. So Holy Spirit, come now as we worship you and depart your vision. 